is Eric Bettel, and I'm the president of the American Energy Society, and I am pleased and proud to be co-hosted, that we are co-hosting uh, the 10th Annual Science Conference with the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, thank you, Dr. Crabtree, for your support, Thomas, for your patience, Katie, for your dedication and commitment. I also want to thank uh, Rao Konadina and Amy Francetic of Buoyant Ventures for helping us connect with energy thought leaders in the Midwest. Um, the American Energy Society is a global association for all energy professionals. We're nonpartisan and energy agnostic. Uh, we, we grow stronger because we have the help of and we help all energy professionals, and it seems to be working. We have about 60,000 friends of the society, which probably makes us the largest professional association for energy in the world. Um, if you're watching this conference right now, and if you're not yet a member, please join. It's free. Um, go to our website. It's energysociety.org and just answer a couple questions, and you get the benefits of membership. We offer publications like Energy Today and Energy Matters, services like expert link micro consulting services, professional development uh, certification badges. Um, business development, of course, and oh, by the way, we will be soon releasing a list of all incubators in the United States that are working on energy, all of them. Uh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 500, and we also rank and rate them. If you want to see tomorrow's energy today, you will absolutely want to see this, this report. Um, also, if you join as a friend this week, uh, you'll get access to the important work of the great fellows, SICE fellows, who are building the Midwest Energy Ecosystem Map. When it's released uh, this week, uh, it's, you'll be able to do comparative analysis. This interactive map will help you with see trends, identify gaps and needs, potential customers, business partners, the opportunities are limitless. Uh, and for lack of a better word, it's fun too. Um, Congratulations to all the fellows for all your work on the maps. It's amazing work. Um, also, uh, I'm pleased and proud to introduce our next speaker, um, our opening keynote, Dan Poneman. Um, to introduce um, Mr. Poneman, I'm going to reference a book, but not his book, Double Jeopardy, which is on nuclear power and cybersecurity, but instead the book Fifth, The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. It's a celebration of government, civil servants, administrators, and bureaucrats who've given so much in their service to the world. Um, readers of The Fifth Risk appreciate the formal challenges and important contributions of agencies like the Department of Energy, which our next speaker knows very well. Uh, but what's left unsaid in The Fifth Risk is the incredible generosity, commitment, and talents of these, these people, these civil servants who serve us well. And that is Dan Poneman, generous, committed, talented, uh, Mr. Poneman is currently President and Chief Executive Officer of Centris Energy. From 2009 to 2014, Mr. Poneman was the Deputy Secretary of Energy, essentially the COO of the Department of Energy, and his responsibilities span the range of energy policies and programs on hydrocarbons and renewables and nuclear and efficiency. He was also responsible, responsible for the Department's efforts on resilience and emergency response, uh, in cases ranging from Fukushima to Hurricane Sandy. And for a brief moment, Mr. Poneman also served as, as the U.S. Secretary of Energy. Prior to this, he served as principal for the Scowcroft. I could go on and on. Dan, we're going to get to you. Um, he, we're going to have Dan talk about sustainable energy and the Gigaton Challenge. Uh, Mr. Poneman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Eric, and thank everybody at the American Energy Society and Katie and Thomas for your great help. Uh, and uh, thank you to the University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I'm very familiar with the great work George uh, Crabtree has done over the years. I was very proud under Secretary Chu to uh, have a small role in helping the launch of uh, these hubs, which were major sources of innovation. And, and George has done pathbreaking work on energy storage, which as you heard from Secretary Chu is gonna be absolutely critical in, in the future. Uh, I'm very proud and delighted to participate in this SICE and uh, I will uh, get right to my slideshow because I know we're running a little behind. Um, I was asked to say something about how I got interested in these things. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll give you the initial version uh, <clears throat> since we got to cycle through uh, this slide and, and I'll go ahead and give uh, the eye strain chart is next, uh, Thomas. Uh, so uh, yeah, I expect there'll be a quiz on this uh, afterwards, but because I'm part of a publicly traded company, I always have to put these disclaimers out and the voiceover won't have to do with that. But basically I had two lifelong passions. 
Uh, they started at different times in my life. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an oceanographer. I got deeply uh, into scuba diving and understanding standing coral reefs and fish life and so forth, and uh, have just been a passionate environmentalist uh, and could not help but you know watch with keen distress over the years as coral bleaching and other things just wreaked havoc uh, on the reefs and became deeply concerned as a citizen. And in the meantime, uh, after I realized there was too much science in oceanography to support my limited you know, scientific capabilities, I turned to uh, nuclear weapons proliferation because I had some opportunities to work as a summer intern for John Glenn, who was very interested in nuclear proliferation. And then, you know, lo and behold, 2009, my two passions of working on nuclear proliferation and weapons issues and environmental issues merged at the U.S. Department of Energy, giving me the opportunity to work under Secretary Chu and then Secretary Moniz on what uh, Steve Chu called our all of the above strategy, of which you've uh, heard uh, just a bit. So uh, let's proceed and uh, uh, get on with the show. This is why I agree uh, with Secretary Chu and his answer to George's first question. We need revolutionary change. Evolutionary is not enough. Uh, this is going to be very familiar to this audience. Uh, we can keep you know, slicing through the uh, slides. Uh, we have to decarbonize power generation. You heard from Secretary Chu. It's not just power generation. It's livestock. It's uh, everything besides. But we, at a minimum, have got to uh, take all of the carbon out of power generation over the next uh, 30 years to 2050 at a time when projected uh, demand for electricity generation is gonna increase by 100%. You don't get there by evolutionary change alone. Let's proceed. Next slide. Uh, this just, you know, graphically uh, shows all the things that we're going to need. Uh, and, you know, you got many more uh, from, uh, from Secretary Chu, so we can keep going. There is a thought out there, uh, perhaps some of the uh, fellows uh, have heard it or may even believe it, that you can get there by a renewable only strategy. Uh, there's been you know, a great amount of work that's been done on bringing the cost down for renewables. But as uh, Secretary Chu was indicating, uh, there are times when the wind does not blow and the sun does not shine. I think Melanie Kendergine is gonna speak to this. Uh, so let's look at a case uh, study of California, which has a very strong uh, climate approach uh, to public policy and um, has tried very hard uh, with renewables to uh, get economy and their environment decarbonized. So in 2011, California got 53% of its power from clean sources. And uh, they've been working hard ever since to deploy wind and solar. Let's see how that's going for them. Well, they got 26 billion kilowatt hours of uh, additional solar. So that, that moved them pretty far down the road. What happened next? Next slide. Oh dear, it's a setback. Okay, next slide. Moving back forward at least. Uh, let's see what happens on the next slide. Oh dear. Okay, so here's the story. After seven years of working really hard at it, California obtains in 2018, 53% of their power from clean energy sources. In other words, zero progress. That is not how you get to zero by 2050. And by the way, you can look at the statistics out of the International Energy Agency, and you will see the same story. That unfortunately, the renewables have been coming in strong, which is good. Unfortunately, it's been replacing zero carbon nuclear energy, which is bad. So that's not how you get an all of the above strategy. That's not how you throw every tool in the toolkit against this climate problem, which is you know potentially 
uh, devastating to our whole planet. Let's uh, go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, you see what happens on business as usual, uh, and you see the dramatic reductions that we're going to have to make. Now, uh, two degrees uh, uh, centigrade target from the Paris Climate Agreement, as, as Secretary Chu said, that anticipates uh, six to nine meter sea level rise. That'd be kind of traumatic for people in places like Miami, Florida, and others. So that's not such a good number. And just to put a sharper point on it, there was a study uh, done by the IPCC that said, really, you know, two degrees is not good enough. At one, at two degrees centigrade by 2050, you will have lost 99% of the world's coral reefs, and you know, uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, the North Pole would be pretty much a thing of the past. You really want to try to get to 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade. It'll still be very, very uh, terrible situation in many respects, but at least you know, somewhat salvageable. Let's go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, bottom line is whether you look uh, to the reports of the IPCC or the International Energy Agency, every credible pathway to 1.5 degree centigrade requires more nuclear and a lot more, usually like at least 2x uh, what we currently have. Next slide. So, you know, unfortunately, we've seen this movie before as well. And we can go ahead uh, to the next slide. There was a lot of enthusiasm for nuclear on climate grounds in the first decade of this millennium. Of Fukushima. And 54 reactors uh, came offline in Japan. Eight reactors immediately came offline in Germany, and the rest are scheduled to shut by 2022. And in our own country, uh, we've gone from 104 to 95 reactors with many more uh, at risk of premature closure because of a lot of uh, market imperfections and the lack of carbon price, et cetera. Next slide, please. Let's, uh, let's bring this closer to home. You know, I wish we could all be in Chicago, but we can't. But there was a significant effort uh, that was uh, required to save uh, three reactors uh, in Illinois, and it was done, fortunately, with the help of the Illinois State Legislature. Uh, but those uh, three reactors, shutting them, would have uh, raised Illinois CO2 commissions emissions over 25 years by half a gigaton. So we're talking about gigaton cha challenge. That's just Illinois. Uh, let's um, uh, go to the next side of the slide. That's just by way of comparison, uh, a lot worse, a lot worse uh, than what happened to the Kuwait oil fires in uh, 1991, or would have been had we not saved those plants. Next slide. I'm going to go quickly over this because I think we're talking mainly about uh, uh, climate. I would just note in passing that uh, when the United States is strong in nuclear and in exporting nuclear power, we also export our safety standards and our nonproliferation standards, which I would submit uh, is uh, second to none. So if nuclear has got an important role to play in fighting climate change, we must be concerned about safety. We must be concerned about nonproliferation. And we must be concerned, therefore, about America's global leadership in nuclear, which once uh, we held unchallenged and now How's it shaking out? Let's uh, go to the next one here. You'll see how the customers line up to the suppliers. So the United States finished building four reactors in China. So now the US order book for foreign reactor exports is uh, zero, exactly zero. Uh, the Russian order book, according to uh, Russian uh, publications, is $130 billion. So uh, that just shows you that we are actually losing the race for global leadership in nuclear. Next slide. In particular, my, my sector of the industry, uranium enrichment, which is the most sensitive uh, for nonproliferation reasons because uranium enrichment as a technology can not only increase the enrichment level of natural uranium to four or five percent, which is needed to boil water to uh, create steam and, and drive uh, 
uh, electricity generation. But you take that same technology, you can raise the enrichment to 90 percent, and you've got a nuclear weapon. This is how things looked in 1985. The United States had 27 million separate work units of capacity. Uh, that's Russia on the far left down at 3,000. What's happened since then? Let's go to the next slide. Oh dear, we're gone. You see that number on the right side? That's zero. Uh, that's how much production we have. We shut the last plant in 2013. It's a long story I can get into in question and answer. Meanwhile, Russia now has exactly almost 27 million through the capacity that we once had. Next slide. Uh, this just is a graphic representation of the same decline. Uh, and the uranium uh, generation is um, uh, the same uh, decline that you've seen. Just a little kink in the curve is we do have one foreign owned enrichment plant in the United States of America uh, in New Mexico, but otherwise our domestic technology generation, generation of enriched uranium is zero. Next slide. So this, as I said, has challenged the US policy to be the dominant supplier of nuclear technology. That has been the foundational principle of US nuclear diplomacy, uh, going back to President Eisenhower's famous Atoms for Peace initiative. And for decades, the United States designed, built, and fueled reactors for all the nations of the world that signed up to nonproliferation norms. And we can actually do it again. So this is not an entirely bleak message. Next slide. There's a lot of excitement uh, and a lot of innovations going on for small modular reactors. Some of them are light water reactor uh, technologies. Some of them use molten salts or liquid sodium. Bill Gates has a liquid sodium uh, reactor at his company called TerraPower, but there's lots of uh, uh, excitement, innovation, and investment in uh, advanced nuclear technology which would have smaller, faster, better, cheaper, safer, uh, inherently safe, proliferation resistant reactors. And there's a lot of buzz and some investment and a lot of opportunity. Next slide. Uh, the strategy, uh, how can we do this? Well, you know, we've done this before. Uh, that's Admiral Rickover, many of you may recognize on the right. And he was the father of the nuclear Navy and the USS Nautilus was uh, the first uh, nuclear powered submarine. And we leveraged the investment in creating the nuclear weapons complex, the nuclear arsenal that depended on enriched uranium and the enriched uranium which supplied uh, naval reactor fuel, both for submarines and carriers. And that was leveraged to actually create the civilian nuclear industry in the United States of America. Next slide. Uh, and there you see the Nautilus, and that blazed the trail. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There is a lot of interest now uh, in uh, nuclear energy from national security perspective, because if you look uh, just at the casualties suffered in Iraq and Afghanistan, you see some specific numbers there. The Americans killed or wounded in fuel supply convoys from 2003 to 2007. If you look overall uh, at the casualties suffered uh, over the whole time we've been in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, over half of those have been from uh, some relationship of supplying fuel to the troops and protecting the convoys. Uh, and so you see that fuel uh, cost delivered fuel is actually quite expensive. $25 a ga gallon is very high. And therefore there's a lot of interest in the Pentagon and there's some investment in uh, what they call micronuclear power plants that could uh, potentially replace a lot of the diesel fuel needed in the field. Uh, so um, uh, that's uh, given rise to a lot of excitement in the industry. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, a just a represent representation uh, of um, one of the sm small uh, designs that's being developed. Project Pele uh, under the Strategic Capabilities Office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense is actually uh, made three uh, contract uh, awards to companies that are developing prototype uh, designs for these very small reactors. You can see the specs here on the slides, one to 10 megawatts transportable, uh, 
they can run over three years without refueling, uh, and uh, they will make a down select, build presumably one prototype, which will be operational by 2023. The goal would be that a service would make a significant buy of these reactors uh, sometime in the next few years. Next slide. So uh, there is a civilian analog to what's going on in the Pentagon and this advanced reactor demonstration project uh, notice uh, for uh, a request for proposals came out on February 6th. The uh, applications are due on August 12th and uh, they are looking at supporting the deployment of two prototypes, advanced reactors uh, and uh, awards will come out and uh, there will be a number of awards granted for risk reduction of advanced designs and some for actual construction. Next slide, please. Of course, you won't get very far with a reactor that doesn't have any fuel. And uh, these reactors, most of them, not the light water designs, but the advanced reactors, the molten salt designs and the liquid metal cooled reactors require what's called high assay, low energy uranium. Whereas a typical uh, current generation plant takes four or 5% enriched uranium and a bomb takes maybe 90%. So does naval reactor fuel at about 19.75% or between 15 and 20%, you get a higher energy density that will support these advanced reactors, but it's not being made uh, anywhere in the country yet. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this just kind of, shows you where it fits in in more uh, prosaic terms. I guess this is along with the uh, 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 slide with the uh, seven or eight year old alcohol that uh, Secretary Chu showed. Next slide. Yeah, okay, so there you go, vintage port. We call it vintage port because that's what my company is making or we're about to. Next slide, please. So uh, the question now presented uh, by the need for this high assay loan of uranium is since there's no industry for it today, how do you get one? And uh, we were looking at turkeys before, now we're looking at a chicken. Uh, the challenge has been the advanced reactor community is having a hard time selling reactors with, with a business case that says, I've got a great reactor for you. I only wish I had some fuel for it, but it's hard to make the very significant investments needed uh, to create this capacity to create this high assay low enriched uranium without a confirmed and cash paying customer base. So uh, how do we solve this uh, chicken and egg challenge? Next slide. We have solved this problem before, keep going. Again, uh, the past maybe prologue going back to George Santayana, the United States actually released uranium for use for civilian uh, atomic power in the 1950s. And let's carry on to the next slide. Uh, this is a story, not every story can be repeated successfully, but this is one that I think can be repeated successfully. The commercial nuclear industry simply would not have emerged without the US government investments. The first a commercial reactor at Chippingport, Pennsylvania, came directly from the naval reactor uh, designs that uh, Admiral Rickover had sponsored. So we are now at our company, uh, full disclosure, making uh, investments ourselves on a cost share contract we have with the US Department of Energy to build 16 machines at the old site of one of the big old gaseous diffusion plants in Python, Ohio, to create a very small 16 machine cascade that will by early 2022, under a new NRC license, be producing this 19.75% high assay low energy uranium, we call it HALU. And uh, so we think that's the first step in reprising the successful story from the 1950s that would then support the further expansion as we can develop some combination of commercial uh, deployment to support US utility needs that are mindful of the climate challenge and also potentially Pentagon needs for resilient, stable, small, and mobile sources of energy, whether it's for uh, forward deployed forces uh, in places like Afghanistan or for military bases that need a resilient uh, source of power 
uh, so we can supply both domestic and international needs. So uh, next slide. Uh, this was sort of a speed chest uh, move through some of the issues. Uh, I go into a lot more detail uh, on all of these issues uh, on this book, Double Jeopardy. When I left the US Department of Energy, I was uh, consumed by this obsession of how we could uh, address the two really existential threats confronting humanity today. We've been talking a lot about climate change, but obviously nuclear terror and the possibility of nuclear annihilation is one that we have thought about and worried about uh, for decades and even generations uh, and has been well embedded in popular culture through movies like Dr. Strangelove, et cetera. And the question in my mind has been since all scientists agree that we need a significant expansion of nuclear power to support our climate uh, objectives, can you have that expansion of nuclear power without running an unacceptable risk of uh, accelerating the other existential threat of the possibility of nuclear terror or destruction? And uh, spoiler alert, my answer is that yes, we can. And uh, the book explains how I think you can do that. So uh, with that, Eric, George, I will uh, stop. I hope we're not too far over and uh, happy to entertain any questions. Hey, hey, George, do you mind if I jump in here? Because we do have some questions. And by the way, uh, Dan, just, I, I'm sure you know this, but the American Energy Society named your book, Double Jeopardy, as one of the best books on energy. So thank you very much. Um, thank you I, very much. So, so there are a couple questions before you turn it over to Melanie, right? Because you're going to be the one to turn it over to Melanie. But I did see some of the fellows. And I just want to summarize in the interest of time. We had... Uh, Zev and Jasmine both asked questions about balancing risk and benefit with nuclear. I'm going to do the main question. So they wanted you to just speak to that, that balance, the issue of balancing risk and benefits, both Zev and Jasmine. And then Seth asked, he said, uh, nuclear power is not available for developing countries. However, is, this, is the small modular reactor that you showed a possibility, or is that also just offline or not a possibility as well. So, so Sep, the fellow Sep, and then also Ze, uh, Zev and Jasmine had these quite balance and then also the small module, or how do we get the nuclear power to developing nations? Yeah, uh, both great questions. Uh, of course, there's no energy source without uh, risk. Uh, if you look at the metrics, nuclear uh, energy is by far uh, the safest. I think only wind is even close. Um, I mean, take a, just a simple example. Uh, Germany is, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember, 1,200 people dying a year from coal emissions that uh, result directly from the closure of the nuclear power plants and the in increase in coal. Uh, the, the millions of people, millions of people who have died over the several decades from fossil fuel emissions. Uh, how does that compare? Well, it depends how you count it. Uh, nobody died at Three Mile Island. Uh, in terms of uh, Fukushima, a tragic uh, accident, of course, but the 18,000 people who died were from the tsunami. And I think they just recorded their first uh, radiation-related fatality in 2018. Uh, so, you know, it was uh, horrifying in so many ways. The one uh, accident that people uh, still think there's uncertainty around it, killed a you know goodly number was uh, Chernobyl. Uh, the numbers usually say about 4,000. Uh, so people say from 1970 to 2009, uh, nuclear power may have killed 5,000 people total, and I don't have it top of my head, but it's millions. So you always have to balance risks. Uh, nuclear has uh, got a very intense focus on safety, and it should. I think it tends to scare people because uh, radiation is invisible. But of course, you know, you fly across uh, the United States, you'll get radiation dosages. There's far more radiation uh, emitted from coal uh, combustion than it is than is released in uh, nuclear power generation. But there's, um, uh, again, no technology, including nuclear, there uh, that uh, is without risk. And, and we just have to balance those risks. The one other thing I would say is, what's, what's the risk of losing the world's coral reefs by 2050? What's the risk of losing the uh, Arctic ice by 2050? So you know, even if you take the very, again, hair-raising number of $200 billion, which is what the cleanup of Fukushima is going to require, it pales in comparison to the uh, costs that will be suffered by people who are displaced uh, you know, uh, by climate change and lose their lives because of um, uh, fossil fuel continuing. 
as Sheikh Yamani said, uh, the Stone Age didn't uh, end because they ran out of stones. In terms of the developing world, actually, you know, there are a number of countries, including uh, chiefly India, um, that have had uh, nuclear power. Uh, and uh, I would say a, a couple things. Uh, generally speaking, the large generation three and generation three plus reactors of a thousand megawatts or more, uh, that's a challenge for some developing country grids, which cannot easily accommodate chunks of power in that size. But in that respect, I, I, I do think uh, there's a lot of promise uh, in these uh, small and even micro reactors uh, that can be uh, deployed more in a distributed generation model. And, um, uh, you know, I think that in Africa, where you're still in a position where there's actually a lot of interest in nuclear from a number of African nations, in Ghana, in Kenya, obviously South Africa already has nuclear power. Um, and uh, you have 600 million people in Africa with no power whatsoever. So um, the big growth in energy demand over the next uh, several decades is gonna be in Asia and Africa. And uh, I do think that nuclear has a very significant role to play there. But I also think that uh, for a lot of reasons, including uh, the risk reward benefit uh, ratio we talked about a minute ago, and also the size of the grids and also the inherent virtues of these advanced technologies that the small uh, and even micro reactors are gonna be a much more promising path in that uh, part of the world. Thank you, thank you. Um, George, should we, uh, we have so many, there's so many questions, Dan, that are pouring in. Um, that now they wanna know about how do you protect and it's how do you make sure it's uh, secure? Uh, Karen, Karen, I asked about if, if this is gonna be exported. How, we have so many questions. I hope you don't mind if we follow up with you, Dan, in the interest of time, is that okay? Oh, no, not at all, not at all. I'm, I'm as eager as you are to hear Melanie and I'm happy to engage with your, uh, with your colleagues. Thank and, you, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. The, the questions continue to pour in. The, the fellows, Jay, Andrew, oh my goodness. We're gonna we're gonna pause. We'll let you introduce Melanie, and then we'll come back. With George, do you have anything you want to bring up? Before oh, let's we do? let's do exactly as you said, Eric. I think that's a okay. good one. And Dan, thank you so much for that. That really was quite informative. Thank Dan, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I can't resist uh, since you there was a little teaser in that line. I'm gonna make one uh, one line answer to the question you almost kind of sort of asked, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is um, how do you ensure security? Uh, and the and the answer to me is, and I made this argument uh, to my predecessor at the Department of Energy, Clay Sell, when they started uh, uh, the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership in the Bush 43 administration, America must lead. We have the strongest non-proliferation record in the world. We have the strongest non-proliferation laws and regulations in the world. And when you export a US reactor, you're exporting a 100 year relationship between the, the investment phase, the design, the construction, the operation and the cleanup phase. And we are ceding that market to other countries. And I mean, no disrespect to anybody, but the fact of the matter is that uh, American standards, I think are non parial And I think those are the standards we wanna propagate. So to me, the one line answer is, how do you ensure security of nuclear globally? If you're talking about weapons proliferation, is the United States has got to get its groove back and begin to reassert the leadership, which sadly we have lost and even squandered uh, in the last several decades. Okay.